We got work to do. And Tulsa, Tulsa is, is, has been called the Christian capital by some. And, and I said, well, you probably should call it the religious capital because because it ain't saved as much as you think it is. A lot of people may go to church on Sunday, but that's about all that God gets, and that isn't always consistent. In fact, George Martin tells us the average Christian now goes to church 2.7 times a week, which they don't even go three out of four Sundays anymore. We become inconsistent because we're busy with life. But you ain't really busy with life. You're busy with activities. When you're rooted and grounded in the church, you got life and life more abundant. Can I get an amen? Amen. So with that, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles. If you have your Bible, I'm reading from the NIV, chapter 21 of John. It starts in the first verse and it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It says that he appeared afterwards again because he had already appeared two times. And this is a third time after his death on the cross that he appeared in his resurrected form to the church. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together, six of them. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. Isn't it interesting? Jesus had died, and now Peter's going to go back fishing. Isn't it interesting how quickly we go back to what we used to do? Because they didn't see the value of what Jesus really did. So they go fishing. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Shouldn't be a surprise. Because God was the surprise on this occasion. They went out because they were fishermen. They knew when to fish and where to fish because they were professionals. They went out at night because at night it cools off, which means the fish go deep during the day. They come up to the surface by night because it's cooler and they were going to fish with a net. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples did not realize it was Jesus. They called, he called out to them, said, Friends, have you any fish? And then said, let me let you know a secret. When God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. Yeah. You have any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, I don't know how long that was, but it said, When they did, They were unable to haul in the net in in because of a large number of fish. The disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter, by the way, that was John, one of the sons of Zebedee. Okay. It's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing a net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said, bring me some of the fish you just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore, and it was full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I want to use as a subject tonight, God will show up. God will show up. I've traveled this country most of my life and more recently for the last four or five years, almost three to four Sundays a month, and I've had a pulse on where the church is and where it isn't. I've seen a lot. And then I know, as I've studied the church, I know what God's plan is for the church. And I realize that there are over 400,000 churches in America today. Only 40,000 are growing. 
And the average growth is 3 to 7%. That's not even keeping up with population growth. We're in between seasons. In the natural, we're in between seasons right now, right? Summer is over and winter is coming. Have you felt that a couple of times in the last week or so? It's just we're, we're right in between seasons. And I can tell you in the realm of the spirit, we're in between seasons. We, we're not where we were, but we're not where we're going. But there's a shift about to happen. There's a change about to happen. God's about to do something that's extraordinarily only him. In other words, God's sovereignty is coming. You know what sovereignty means? I'm God and I've got all by myself and I don't need your vote. I'll do what I want, when I want, how I want, but I'd just soon do it with you if you'd let me. But I am sovereign. And so we're seeing the church being shaken in this hour, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing because if we're not careful, we get used to going to church. We get used to Sunday mornings. We, we get used to, I told one preacher one time, I said, the worst thing you do is learn how to preach. Because when you learn how to preach, you know how to get a message. But when you know God, he gives you the message. And, and so, so there's this shift in, and there's this tendency that I like where we are. And people get comfortable with that. Rather than what God is doing, I enjoy what God did. And there are three things that are happening in the church that, that we have to identify to understand what God's doing. And the first is human tradition. Many of us call that the Bible way. But oftentimes it's nothing more than human tradition. The second thing is preference. It's things that you like and the way you like it. And the third thing is biblical foundation. There's only one of the three that are absolutely necessary for what God's about to do. And that's biblical foundations. We must never veer from biblical foundations. But when you understand that a lot of what the church does has been human traditions. And then there are some preferences. We like certain styles of music. We want certain things to happen. We get comfortable with the way things happen often and we just assume it happened that way every time. But unfortunately, when, when you build everything around human traditions and preferences, you lose the anticipation and expectation of God. In other words, where are you going? We're going to go into church, and we'll have church, and we'll sing a few songs, and we'll take an offering, the pastor will preach, and we'll go home. Yeah, yeah. And you get used to what God has done in the past. Rather than where are you going, we're going to meet with God. And I don't know what he's going to do, but I have an expectation that somehow God's going to show up and when God shows up, something's going to happen. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to get changed. I'm not going to spend two hours of my time and leave the same person that came in. When I walk through those doors, I'm going to be a different person. We're professional at praying for other people. We need to be professionally involved in our own life so that we can be changed so we can change other people. So here we pick up the story, and the disciples now are in this process of Jesus coming back a third time, but they don't even recognize him on the shore. So let's let the scripture now, the text or the context of our text, unfold before us with some prophetic ears. Come on, touch your ears. Say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. I'm your servant, I'm your servant. and I'm listening. Amen. So let's just break it down just for a few minutes. And the first thing that when God shows up is where he appeared, where he appeared. See, we read the scripture so fast, we forget that there might be more in the text. So the Bible says that he was at the Sea of Tiberias. Tiberias means good vision. Good vision. There's, a, there's an hour that we are now facing that we have to have vision. Because sight will mess you up. 
Sight always sees where you're at. Vision sees where you're going. And when you don't have vision but sights, the, the present always tells you how you can't get out of what you're in. It always tells you your limitations. It always tells you about your past that's very close to your present that's trying to pull you back. But when you get vision, you start looking unto Jesus, the author. That means he's writing a book on you. Amen. And some of you have been stuck in a chapter and you haven't been able to get out of that chapter. And the Lord told me to tell you tonight that he's about to start the next chapter. you got to let that chapter go because he's writing another chapter on you. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. So he showed up in a good vision. He shows up where he could see them. He saw the disciples. They were out in a boat. He saw their frustration. He saw their toil. He saw their need. I came to tell you that God sees a whole lot more about you than you give him credit for. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. He knows your frustration. And if you'd be wide open to him, you'd be amazed what he could do in your life. And so he came to tell you tonight that he has good vision. He sees. The old, the old songwriter says, I is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. Then it was also a place where they could see him. He was on the shore. A place where he could, they could see him. They didn't recognize him because he was afar off, but they could recognize that somebody was there and he was talking with them. Then he shows up and he starts doing something. The last time he walked on the sea, this time he's staying on the shore. Don't expect him to come to you every time walking on the water. There's sometimes he'll call you unto himself. In other words, this time he said, I came through a door the last two times. And you were shocked. But this time, I'm making myself accessible to you. Now you come to me. See, sometimes we want God to come to us and worship, but worship really is coming to him. Worship is, and then I had a person tell me one time, they said, well, you know, I, I, I just come for the word. I said, you are selfish. They said, no, I come for the word. I want the word. I said, yeah, but God wants your worship. Yeah. 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 And you, you shortcut God. Because God isn't sitting in heaven right now, and, and I'm preaching, and he said, man, I never thought of that. I, I, you know, I, I, no, 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 no. Where God was was he inhabited the praises of his people. Amen. So he came in, and he softened your heart, and he opened up your mind so you could get the word so you could be changed. So Tiberius means vision, but shore is an accessible place, a place where he can be easily approached. When, he, when did he show up? He showed up in the morning, the Bible says. But when the morning was now come, he showed up in the morning. Morning signifies the breaking of a new day. See, I think we're on the, on the, the brink of a new day. I, I, you know, thank God for everything he's done. Thank God for what he did. I've studied all the past revivals, and I give God praise for all the wonderful things he did, all the tent meetings and Shambach and A.A. Allen, all these guys. It was all wonderful. I've studied it. I, I, I've walked with them in that process, and I thank God what he's doing today. But I think we're on the brink of a new day which is trying to tell you that it's the morning of your life in me. You're on the brink of a new day. See, don't judge where you are, judge where you're going. See, I'm, I'm giving you a fresh beginning. I'm giving you a new start. I, I came to you in the morning to remind you that I can do what you thought I could only do at night. I'm going to do it in the morning. The morning means an opportune time. It means a, a, that, uh, that sight is available, that when you wake up in the morning, you, something happens. And, and I believe God's given us a wake-up call. Church be the church. Quit playing games. Quit playing church and be the church. Enter into praise. Worship me in the depths of who I am. 
listen and receive the word. Be changed and be a change agent in the world in which you live. He showed up in the morning. Sometimes you don't understand the morning as much as you understand the night. The nighttime. And the scripture often exemplifies darkness, lack of vision, weeping, confusion, blindness, a veil. The Bible says in Psalms, weeping may endure for a but joy comes in the morning. I came to tell you, get ready to enjoy the morning. Get ready to enjoy the morning of a new life in him. Oh, I've been serving him for 20 years. Yeah, but there's a new day coming. There's a new moment coming. He's coming in the morning time to help you understand what he's about to do in the earth. We are on the brink of a move of God. I'm going to try to unfold it slowly, but I'm telling you we're on the brink of a move of God. I've got a pulse on this thing. I've studied it now for the last five years. And I feel a pulse, and we're on, the, we're on the brink of a move of God. And I believe Tulsa is, is a strategic place for this next move. So how did he come? He also came in, in a different day, in a different way. I told you he came the first, last two times through a door. This time he's on the shore. It's a new day, and he's coming in a new way. And you got to be open to God coming in a new way. You got to be open to, for God to do things that He hadn't done before, and how and and you can't put God in your box because He doesn't fit. So if we'll come, we'll have praise and worship, and we'll take the offering, and then preach the word. Then at the end of the word, then we'll have the altar call. And we'll do. And you already missed five things they want to do in your life because you're waiting for the altar call. God's about to do something in a new way. People are about to come to the altar during worship to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we didn't give the altar call yet. But God's going to do it anyways. Amen. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm waiting for the day. I'm waiting for the day when all of a sudden people get out of their cars and the Spirit of God hits them getting out of their cars and they're trying to get into church. But on the way, three or four people meet them, lead them to Christ. Get them baptized in the Holy Ghost and pray for healing over their life in the parking lot before church starts. We're coming into a new day. And God's about to do it differently. We thought it should just happen at the altar. And we anoint people with the sign of the cross on their forehead. What if God wants to do something different? Are we open to it? Well, you know, Pastor, we don't want to get too radical. <laughs> really? You're saying that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? It's a new day. And God's about to do it in a new way. The third time he came. He showed up also when their efforts were exhausted. I know what it is to Pastor. 40, this is my 46th year. Pastoring. 46 years. I know what it is to get to the place of exhaustion. I know what it is to say, it's another day, God, just give me the grace to make it through today. I got people lined up outside. I got a wedding this, this weekend, and I, now they just called and said to somebody's funeral, and I got this, and I got that, and, and just seven days a week until there were moments of potential exhaustion in my life. I was fine with 100 people and 200 people, but when it hit five, six, eight, thousand, fifteen hundred people, it got overwhelming. But I'm telling you, God knows your place of exhaustion. It's not just for pastors. You got kids and you got a job and you got a home and you got a marriage and you got and just everything going on. There are programs and this and I got to do this and and you're, you're, you get exhausted. But God sees you in your exhaustion. He sees you when you've toiled all night. And you've got nothing. You've got nothing. Just with a pastor several months ago, or actually two years ago now, 
And for the last seven years, they had not grown one person. And this is an anointed house and an anointed preacher. But no salvations in over seven years. No new members in over seven years. Well, a few new members, but every member that came, old members left. You know, that, that's when they feel led. <laughs> Took me years to figure out what lead was. I got it now. Lead poisoning is what it is. Lead poisoning. <laughs> I, I, took me years to figure that out. I feel led. My time is up. You're exhausted and you need to come to the altar and get refreshed in the Holy Ghost and get to work and build the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. So what did he say when he showed up? Children, brothers, do you have, and one translation says, do you have any meat? Catch any fish? Do you realize your lack? See, if we don't realize where we're at and what we need, then we don't know how to meet God. What is it you really need from God? What is it you, you need to receive to get you to your next place? We all need something. What do you need? Do you have any meat? No. We toiled all night, have nothing. We worked all night. We're professional fishermen. We have nothing, no fish, none, none. He said, once you realize your lack, then you're ready for me to speak. When you realize what you don't have, you're ready for your next. If you still think you have it together, you're, you're walking around telling people, I got it, I got it, praise the Lord, amen. God is good. And none of that's really happening in your life. But when you come to the place and say, man, something is missing. I need something down on the inside of me. I, I, I need God to work way down on the inside of me. There's something that's trying to hinder me. There's a block somewhere. I've kind of shut down and I, I'm not making progress. I need to break this thing. I need somebody to pray a prayer of agreement and break this thing off of me so I can begin to move again. Did you catch anything, guys? How'd you do last night? How many times did you throw that net out? Oh, I, I forgot. You, you guys are professionals, right? You, you did this for a living, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know you know the exact place to go, and you know where to throw your net, and you always get results, and now you're not getting results. He said, let me help you. Throw the net on the right side. Now, can you think just for a minute? These, these were men. They were fishermen. And they hadn't recognized it was Jesus yet. And he telling them how to fish. This is what I do for a living. I know what to do. I know where to go. I, we threw the nets over, but nothing came in. It's just it's something crazy going on. And they, we try to rationalize in our minds why the thing that has happened all the time in the past isn't happening now. So we begin to dialogue with a person that's trying to help us. But we're not acknowledging him for who he is. How'd you guys do? Nothing. Let me help you. Throw the net on the right side. Now. This whole night we've thrown it left side, right side, back side, front side, every side. What's, what's different about the right side now? Nothing but the word of the Lord. Nothing but the word of the Lord. That's, that's just, just a small difference, small difference. Just the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. But see, if we don't know the word of the Lord, we don't know what to do. That's why the, that's why the nation of Israel had the sons of Issachar who understood the times and knew what the church should do. See, everybody wants to prophesy, but nobody knows what God's doing. And I've talked to some prophets. They prophets. 
And they, went, they, could, they couldn't understand what God was doing in this hour because we were in between seasons. And I said, you just don't understand what God's doing. He's getting us ready to hear his voice in a whole different level. You can't afford to wait from Sunday to Sunday just to get the voice through your pastor, though that you should be able to get the voice of God through your pastor. But you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday that you also need the voice of God to speak in your life. Hello. Amen, somebody. So, so it becomes vitally important that we hear the instructions that God's about to give us because one instruction from God can change everything. It shifted the entire uh, prophetic voice of God, shifted the entire nation of God to Israel in that moment. Because those men were, 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 were the men that God would raise up and use after he was gone. They would never forget that moment. Not because they had 153, though I find it interesting, they counted 153 fish. It was very interesting. But, but, but the fact that, that they tried in their own effort and could not, but one word from God changed everything. So if we do not know the voice of God in this hour and what he's about to do, we will miss it with good hearts and a love for him. And you can miss what God's about to say. One word from God can change everything. One word from God. Cast your net. May not make sense. You may be tired. You may not feel like it. But cast the net one more time. I've heard that before. Yeah, but you've heard it again. Cast the net. Cast the net. One more time. One more time. Boys, do what I tell you to do. Cast the net on the right side. Which means they could have said, well, brothers, don't worry about it. You can cast it on the left side. He just given instructions, but we've done this all night. But they didn't. They cast the net on the right side of the boat. Because what they didn't fully understand is that he not only created them, but he also created the fish. And so at his voice, the fish gathered on the right side of the boat. See, see, you, you, we don't understand who we serve. You don't understand the man that we serve. The man that we serve has got control of everything. All power, say all power belongs to him. Which means he can, he can, he can speak to a hospital and cancel a $60,000 bill with one word. He can pay off a school bill with one word from heaven. You're free. Don't make another payment. One word. He can change the diagnosis with one word. I know what the doctor said. And their diagnosis may have been right yesterday. But today, I've showed up, and I've got another diagnosis that by my stripes, you were, you were, you were, not are, you were already healed. It's yours today. One word, one word, one word, one word, one word. One word will change everything. You see, we... We come to church, and we think we're doing God a favor. I went to church this morning. Look at me. I was faithful to go to church this morning. As if you did God a favor, and he's supposed to stand up in heaven and say, Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, child. When one moment in his presence can change everything. That's why the whole time, you can ask Pastor Lawrence, the whole time I pastored, I was never late for a moment of worship. 
Ask Janice, not a moment. I was never late, not one service. Not because I wanted to be known as a preacher that always was on time, because I wanted God. I knew in a few moments I would have to preach, and I needed God. I needed God, and sometimes I went through a bunch of stuff. And y'all, they didn't know it. They didn't know it. They didn't know on a Saturday night my, my son was strung out in drugs and, and, and on the front port yard and, and police were there and I was up till three or four in the morning. They, they didn't know that. I got up, amen, came and preached the word of God. And because, but, but I got into his presence so that he could heal my heart and open my spirit so I could preach. One moment, one moment, one moment, one moment. I don't like that song as much as other songs. You just missed your moment. You just missed your moment. Well, I got there as soon as I could. I'm 20 minutes late. You just missed your moment. Your healing was in the first song God had designed it for you. And you out playing and doing this and doing that and getting all, every, all your hair all right and all your dress all right and all your makeup all right and all this and all that. And so you come in late, all dialed up, amen. But, but you could have left all that go, amen, because you needed God more than you needed to look good. Just one moment in his presence can change everything. 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 It may not make sense, but just do what I tell you to do. Elijah had a servant that, that, that just had to obey him. He had just called fire down from heaven, but he had prophesied earlier that there would be a drought. There was no rain. No rain means no food, which means famine. So he prophesied there was a famine, and he had to live in his own prophecy. Until God had to send ravens to feed him. He could have picked a better bird than a raven. Amen. That's a dirty bird. Amen. But, but he picked a raven and the raven fed him in the famine that he prophesied. And now he calls down fire. But all of a sudden, he, he sends his servant. He said, go out and tell me what you see. And the servant walks out and said, nothing. Water, I mean, but no, no, Nothing. Nothing's out there, really. He said, go back again. He goes back again. Nothing out there. Comes back and said, there's nothing out there. Go back again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go back again. Nothing out there. About the fourth time, he's thinking the old prophet's getting senile. Uh, what, what is he doing? He's lost his mind. He goes back the fifth time. Nothing. Sixth time. Nothing. Seventh time, he goes out. He said, the prophet just doesn't know there ain't, there's nothing out there. Well, it ain't much, but... At least I see something. At least I can tell. Hey, prophet, man. It, it, it looked a little bit like a cloud. It's only about the size of a man's hand, but it, I mean, it's out there. And I said, that's it. That's it. The rain is coming. The rain is coming. I came to tell you there's a rain coming. The heavens are about to open up. And a rain is coming. You mark this day. i got to come back to this church. So I just can't tell you anything. I'm telling you there's a rain coming. There's a harvest coming. There's a harvest coming. you got to get ready. Pastors, get your church ready. There's a harvest coming. you got to get your church ready. There's a harvest coming. There are people designed for your church. they got to come to get it at your church. No church, any church won't make it. It's your church. It's... It's your church. You got to come. We, we, we got cards that we put out in the lobby, and it has a teacup on it. It said, If we're not your cup of tea, here's six churches that really preach the gospel. Go to church. Every year we do a capital C Sunday. You know what that means? Capital C means church. And it said, Don't come to church. We're not, we're not having church. Don't come to church. Bring your offering. Go to churches in the city. Go all over the city. Just go all over the city. And the last two years we've done that. It's just been amazing what happens because we believe in the city. If there has to be a Jerusalem before there's a Judea and a Samaria in the uttermost parts of the world. 
There has to be a Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem is Tulsa. It's this city that we belong to. That's why unity in the community is more than just a cliche. It's a command from God. I've been a part of 17 pastors, fellowships, and prayer meetings over the years. 17. I counted them. I might have missed a couple. Most of them phased out because it takes a commitment longer than a few months, sometimes longer than a few years. And it takes covenant. We care about the community. We care about the community. So we come out for the sake of the community. I knew when this church came to this community that, that God was getting a harvest ready. This is a rough community, along with 61st and Peoria. Bobby, this, this area and 64th and Peoria are the two roughest parts of all of Tulsa. There's more drugs, prostitution in those two areas than any two areas in this entire city. And there's two church plants right there, right now. Get ready for the harvest. Get ready for the harvest. Don't pray for people from other churches to come to your church. Leave them alone. Usually if people from other churches come, they bring a whole mess with them. Just leave them alone. Just go down the road somewhere. Amen. But get, bring the lost. Get the lost. Get the lost. Have a heart for the lost. Jesus was trying to help them. He said, I've come uh, that you might have life, that you might have it more abundant. Get the lost. Cast your nets. See, it was a command in the natural, but it was a demand in the spirit. Cast the nets. Cast the nets. Every one of you has nets. Cast your nets. What is my net influence? What is your influence? It's with your relatives. It's with your neighbors and friends. It's with your coworkers. Cast the nets. I wish God would tell me what to do. I just told you. You're a missionary. You're a missionary to your relatives. They can see the change in your life. They think you're crazy and lost your mind, but you really found your life. Amen. Cast your net among your relatives. Some of you are about to have Thanksgiving with them and Christmas with them, and you know they're crazy, just crazy, off their rocker. Cast your net. Get them in the house of God. Cast your net to your neighbors and friends. Amen. You have influence. They've seen the change in your life. Cast your nets. Cast your net with your coworkers. Amen. They see the life you live at work. Cast your nets. Cast your nets. And I'm almost through. Cast your nets. And then he said before they left, he said, bring me what you have. Isn't that interesting? Bring me what you have. The interesting thing is, is we overread the fact that there were Fish already being fried on the fire. It was in our text. And Jesus still stopped and said, bring me what you just caught. Because we're interested in somebody else serving the food. And we forgot we just caught the food. Bring me what you have. Bring those people to me. See, we think we have to be theologians to talk to the lost. Forget it. They don't understand theology any more than we do. Just forget it. Just, you know, the greatest tool you have is your testimony. You know why? It's yours. And nobody can take it from you. They can't tell you that ain't real because you just lived it. Amen. God has delivered me. God set me free. Whatever it is, your testimony is the greatest weapon you have against the enemy. Share your testimony. Invite people to church. Bring me some of what you just caught. And once they did, he said, now, come and dine. Come and eat. Come and eat. Come and eat. Just come and eat. Come and enjoy a feast. Because I'm about to change you. God's still on his way. He's coming. God will show up. He's going to show up in some unusual ways. Get ready. 
I'm not Bishop Jakes, but I wish I could say, get ready, get ready, get ready. And you understand what I say rather than just be excited by the way I said it. Get ready. God's about to use you. Well, I'm not an evangelist. You have a testimony. Share your testimony. God will show up. God's going to show up on your job. Some of you are about to get favor, and they're going to overstep three people that deserve that raise and give it to you. You're going to start seeing unusual things happen. Unusual things happen. Come, guys. God's getting ready to do something. I came to tell you tonight, God's about to show up. When God shows up, things are going to take place. Things are going to happen. And they're going to happen through you. They're going to happen through you. Don't give up on meeting together. Well, it's just another church meeting. No, you don't understand. This is about a city. It's about a city. It's about a community. Tulsa is known for its churches. I don't know how many churches. I tried to find out how many churches. I think I, I tried to find some figures, and they were all over the place, but one said over 2,000 churches in our city. But they just exist. Your, ch your church is to be a light to the lost. A beacon. There's hope here. We want to help you. Come. We want to help you. We want to help you. God will show up. I said God will show up. Come on, say we're on the brink of a move of God on a move of God a move of God I'm trying to tell people everywhere break the mold break the mold break the mold guys break the mold break the mold I got pastors mad at me because I tell them reach the millennials reach the millennials oh, it ain't about all the millennials really see we don't even know there's a generation Z on the heels of the millennials they're 19 years old right now, Generation Z. We got to reach them. They're a lost generation. Absolutely. Who do you want to reach? You want to reach people from other churches? Leave them alone. Reach the lost. Reach the lost. God will show up. There's going to come a time when salvations by the dozens are going to happen every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday. Every Sunday, just a few Sundays ago, I got a report. And the people that give me a report from our church, they don't play. It's exact. They don't play. 311 people came to Christ on a Sunday morning. 311 people came to Christ on a Sunday morning. That was the exact report. Don't think that's strange because it's coming to your house. It's coming to your house. It's coming to your house. Amen. Lift your hands all over this auditorium. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Just lift your hands all over this auditorium. I didn't come to try to preach a top ten sermon. I came to tell you God's up to something. There's a fresh anointing. There's a fresh anointing. There's a fresh anointing. I'm asking that fresh anointing to come on you, to come on you, fresh anointing to come on you. Come on, just ask him right now. I'm going to turn over in a few minutes, but just let the Lord saturate you right now.